Hey guys, what's going on? Welcome to the rating climb from 2000 to 2200. I've got two games that I want to show you. Let's jump right in. Okay, so for the first game, I was white against a 2154, and I played e4, and he played d6. Now, d6 usually can lead to, if they played knight f6, it can lead to positions similar to the King's Indian defense. Uh, if they play g6, which is kind of what I was expecting, it's I think it's called the modern defense, and it's also very similar to the King's India defense, but you can even play it against e4. So that's kind of what I was expecting, and I have a system that I like to play against those setups, and so I'll, you'll see that in just a second. So I played d4, just gaining control of the center, and sure enough, he does play g6, and so usually they'll go bishop e7, usually something like c6, and then the knights here and here. And so my plan is to put my knight on c3, so I'm just controlling the center. And then after bishop g7, I play bishop e3. Now, one thing that's very good to know is whenever your opponent fianchettos their kingside bishop like, like this on g7, a good trick that you can do is put your bishop on e3, put your queen on d2, and you create this battery where you can eventually, at some point in the future, bring your bishop there and trade this off. And that's usually a good thing because this bishop on g7 it's controlling a lot of central squares and it's really hard to get to because it's, it's kind of hidden behind the pawns. You can't really attack it with a knight, right? Because all of these, these squares are, are covered by the pawns. So the only way that you can really trade that bishop off is with your own dark squared bishop. And so that's what I like to do a lot of times uh, against this setup, especially if they castle there, removing that bishop usually opens up their king and you can take advantage of some of these weaknesses that this pawn push creates. So that's what I was kind of setting up. And so he played knight of six. I played f3. This is a common setup against this opening that you can do. You put the pawn on f3 to really just solidify these squares and it protects your bishop while you're setting up this battery to you know try to trade this guy off. So this is the setup that I like to do. Knight on c3, bishop on e3, and then f3 to kind of support the, the pawns. And one other bonus is if they castle early, which some people do, um, you're set up for a quick attack because you can very easily play g4 because it's defended by the pawn. So you can play g4, h4, h5, and you know after you trade this off, your rook's in a nice position. Can you can get a very quick attack? So I was considering those kind of things as this game kind of went on. So he did play c6. This is pretty standard for this type of system. I played a4. Um, you know, a lot of times they like to play b5 and then b4 chases your knight away and they can get some queenside pressure going. So by playing e, uh, by playing a4, I'm just preventing that right away. And even if they try to play like a6 and then b5, well, I can still capture it, and this rook creates a pin to where they can't even take it back. So by playing a4, it really makes it, it hard for them to push b5. It takes a lot of preparation. So I like to throw that move in um, occasionally, and so I did that here. And so instead of b5, my opponent just played b6. And I continued kind of with my plan, setting up this battery. It also, I had the option to castle queenside, although because I played a4, I probably wasn't going to castle queenside right away. Um, can get a little risky yet, you know, when you push a pawn like that and then castle that side. So really when I play against this modern King's Indian type of setup, I like to kind of wait and see what my opponent does. So if he goes ahead and castles, then I'm, I'm usually pretty quick to start an attack. If he starts busting open the center with e5, d5, c5, something like that, then I'm going to start thinking about maybe castling, you know, depending on what he does. And so I like to kind of wait as far as my king is concerned before I commit to castling a certain way. So he played a6. This is a little bit uh, interesting, moving four pawns like this. Usually d6 and c6 definitely happen, and then they usually will play like knight d7 and castle, or even maybe queen c7. So this is a little interesting and I decided that why not go ahead and, and take advantage of the fact that he's not really developing pieces. Go ahead and trade off these bishops right away. And he hasn't even castled, so maybe I can even open up the center at some point and take advantage of that. So I played bishop h6, and he did take it, and I took it back. And now you can see that there's weaknesses here that the, because the bishop is gone, my queen can come in. Now I'm not going to just move there immediately because you just play rook g8 and it doesn't really do much. But... I do have attacking chances because I was able to trade off that dark squared bishop. So that's a very good uh, thing to remember if you're playing against people who are fianchettoing their bishop and you're not really sure how to deal with it. Put your bishop on e3, queen d2, go trade it off, and I think you'll notice you get a lot of opportunities that way. 
So he played queen c7, and I developed a piece, but I'm also lining up on this square so that now a move like queen g7 is a little bit more of a threat because now I would be you know, threatening the rook and the pawn on f7. So he played bishop b7, and I thought for a while here, and I didn't actually see a concrete win, but I figured if I sacrificed my bishop on f7, followed it up by knight h3, I could hop into g5, it looked like I was going to get a pretty good attack. Now, I don't think it was maybe the best move. And actually, I'll tell you real, real quick here. Let's see what the computer says. Yeah, so the Stockfish does not like that move. It's saying that it's better for black. But, you know, sometimes computers can see the perfect defense and a human opponent will mess it up. And so that's why I like to, when I have opportunities to play aggressive and, and sacrifice pieces, I usually go for it. So that's what I did. I just sacrificed my bishop. He recaptured and I played knight h3. And the idea is I want to hop in here. And then once he moves, I have another hole here that I can hop into, which is also attacking the queen, setting up for my queen to go to g7. So I have a lot of threats. Now, I think he could have dealt with it if he knew the correct moves to play. But uh, you'll see real, real quickly here, he didn't do that. So rook f8 was not the right defensive move. And that's because it doesn't deal with the threat of knight to g5. After he moves, I'm going to go to e6 and I have a fork and you'll see that's what happened. I played knight g5. And after knight e6, he just resigned because it's actually not only forking the queen and the rook, I also have checkmate on g7. And one thing I want to point out, this was a 10 minute game and you see my opponent had 8 minutes and 36 seconds left. So he was playing very quickly and I think he just completely didn't see this move, um, which was a little bit surprising at, at 2100. Most of the time, I think players would, would see that, but you know, it happens. 10 minutes is, is still a kind of a quick game. So that was a very quick one. Um, but I hope you can kind of see the idea of, of how putting the bishop on e3, the queen on d2, and trading off that bishop made all this possible, right? Because that bishop on g7 is no longer defending the squares that it normally defends. So let's go on to game number two. All right, so this game I was playing against the 2130, and I was black. He played e4, so I played Scandinavian defense like usual. He captured, and again, knight f6. If you've been watching a series, you know this is the line I like to play. Played d4, and I played bishop g4. Again, the idea is if they block with f3, it takes away one of the better squares for the knight to go to. So that's why you will, you know, sometimes like to play this bishop g4 move. He actually played bishop g5, bishop b5 check. And so I blocked with a pawn. He captured. And at this point, if you'll notice, his queen is still uh, being attacked, and it's my turn. So I could take it. The problem with that is if I take it, he has this nasty little move c7 check and i'm losing my queen right and it almost looks like i could play queen d7 and if he takes i could take back maybe that's playable but then he has c8 queen and it's checkmate because my queen is is pinned right so that's a little trick there so i could not take the queen even though it, it kind of looked like a free queen so i had to recapture and then he played f3 attacking my bishop so i retreated that and bishop c4. And so at this point, this is pretty standard for, for how this line could go. You know, you bring the bishop out, you get the pawn to the f3 like we talked about, takes away the square from the knight. The bishop goes back on this diagonal, and then you just have to complete your development, which is what I was, was doing next. So I played e6. It blunts the, the bishop that he has on that diagonal and also lets out my bishop on f8. All right, so he played c3, and I played bishop d6. So I'm just figuring out where can I develop this bishop that's going to be the most active diagonal? really don't have any other options except e7 or d6, and I thought this looked like a pretty nice place for that bishop. He played knight e2, and I played knight b to d7. And I could have castled here, but again, and you, you hear me talk about this a lot, I like to wait when I'm not sure what my opponent's going to do. Like, he hasn't castled there yet. So for, you know, as far as I'm concerned, he might be thinking of playing g4, h4, like launching these pawns on my king side. So if I just castle without even thinking about it, I could find myself under a pretty, you know, quick attack, right? Because he's going to have a lot of these moves with tempo. He's going to play g4, I have to move the bishop. He could play g5, I have to move the knight. And so I'm not going to have time to like launch some sort of counter attack when I'm moving my pieces around and he's just pushing his pawns forward. So that's why instead of castling right away, I decided, you know what, let's just develop a piece first and see what he does. And now if he castles, then I was probably just going to castle. And I feel much safer about that because his king's already there, he if he does push those pawns forward at that point, he creates weaknesses around his king, right? So 
very important as you especially as you get to these higher levels to be careful about just castling into what could be an, a potential attack and sure enough he doesn't even wait for me to castle he just launches the attack right away g4 so i played bishop g6 and h4 just like i talked about and and this is something that i've seen before so when you play the bishop g4 to make them play f3 you have to be aware that they're set up to play g4 and h4 and this does happen a lot. So the major threat is that he, if he plays h5, this bishop's going to be trapped. Now, I could trade it off for the knight, but I don't really want to just trade that bishop for that knight over there, which isn't doing anything. So I played h5 to prevent him from trapping my bishop. So he plays g5, attacking the knight. I have to go somewhere, and I thought d5 looked like a nice centralized square. It's well defended, and it's controlling some important uh, squares here. So that's why I played knight d5 as opposed to something like knight h7. Very, very passive. I don't want to put my knight over here on the side where it's not doing anything. So he played bishop d3, and one thing that I'm considering at this point is if these bishops get traded off, like let's say he takes it and I recapture, I do have to be careful that queen d3 could come next, and I, I'm going to have some weaknesses here on the light squares. Now that being said, I also am looking at his king, and some of these dark some of these dark squares that are wide open i've got my bishop lined up already so what i decided to do was play queen c7 and the idea is i want to come here and take advantage of the fact that his king is just sitting there and he's he's pushed really all these pawns forward um it looks like i could could get some sort of attack on his king so that's why i played queen c7 so he captured my bishop and the first move that obviously came to mind is i could just recapture the bishop but I didn't want to give him an opportunity to prevent me from from going here and forcing his king to move because once I can make his king move, he can't castle. You know, he can't like move these pieces and, and castle queenside to get to like a safer spot. So I thought that throwing this check in before I recaptured the bishop made a lot of sense, just because, like I said, I wanted to make sure that his king couldn't castle. So I played bishop g3 to force a move like king f1. If he was if he captured me, I just would have retaken with the queen, and same kind of thing would have happened. So now that his king cannot castle, now I feel comfortable, you know, taking the time to recapture that. And so he played queen d3, and remember earlier I talked about these weaknesses along the white squares. Now I have to figure out how do I want to handle that. So in a position like this, there's a couple of ways that you can think about it. One is you can just react to the attack and just defend it, right? So here's the attack. He's threatening this. I could just defend it by like maybe knight e7, defend my pawn, right? The other way to think about it is his king is not really in a safe spot. He can't castle and he doesn't really have much pawn coverage. So I could also think about how can I counterattack his king? And that's the route that I went with in this position. So I castled, even though like, yeah, I'm letting him take this pawn. His queen's gonna be in front of my king, but he doesn't have a, any other pieces available to help him right now. Like these guys are too far. This knight maybe at some point could come over, but right now it, it can't really come closer I have it covered so it's only his queen and it's going to take a few moves for him to generate a threat right like queen here queen here pawn to g6 and then he has a checkmate threat but that takes one two three I mean that takes four moves so I was basically saying okay I think that if he takes this my attack that I'm going to get after I take with my rook here and attack his king I think my attack is going to be stronger and maybe a little bit quicker than what he's trying to do and also, I noticed that if he captured here, captured here, and played g6 to set up a checkmate threat, I could play knight f6 and attack his queen and also cover the, the square. So it looked like I was fine there. So because of that, I decided let's go ahead and castle and get my rook into the game, put some pressure on, on his king. Now at this point, I played knight f4 check. Um, I was trying to just trade off some pieces around his king. Now he, he did just trade with the bishop, so it didn't really accomplish too much. I didn't really see a way to make progress at that moment, so I thought I would go here, try to trade off something, and see if it would open up any other opportunities. So he captured, and I recaptured. And then the queen did come in. And so like I said, the only threat that I saw was that he was going to capture here, play g6, and then queen h7 checkmate, but I could just deal with that with knight f6. So I wasn't too concerned, and decided it was time to just bring another piece over. And also defend this pawn, he was attacking that as well, but really, I'm bringing this rook over so that I can at some point play e5 and get this this file opened up and have you know both of my rooks involved in the game so he took that and remember g6 is a threat but after knight f6 he's got to move his queen i'm covering the checkmate it doesn't have any other threats 
I'm feeling pretty comfortable here. So I went ahead and played e5, again, just following through with my plan of activating the rest of my pieces. He played knight a3. And now I was considering two different moves here. One option is capturing on d4 to open up the file like I had planned. And then the other move, and that's the move that I actually played, was e4, which also is going to open up the file because I'm going to trade with this pawn. And I thought that by capturing here, it, it gives his knight a nice square on d4 to kind of sit, which is very centralized. Now I could just chase it away with c5. So I think that actually would have been a pretty solid move. But I figured e4 looked pretty strong as well, just to open up, you know, the files this way. So my opponent played rook f1. He's planning ahead to start defending some of these things, I think, is, is what his plan was, because I do have this rook lined up. And I'm attacking it, obviously, again here. So I went ahead and traded it off, and he took back with the queen. Now, at this point, this is, again, a position where tactics really pay off. You have to find some sort of good move. And... The good move has to do with the fact that my rook is lined up on its queen. So I have a discovered attack with my bishop. So again, just a reminder, anywhere that I move my bishop is going to attack his queen. And he has to deal with the queen threat. So that kind of gives my bishop free reign to go wherever I want. So for example, I could play a move like bishop c1, which normally you can't play a move like that, or he just takes you, right? There's three pieces that could just take my bishop. But in this case, if I do that and he takes my bishop, I'm taking his queen. So I can play a move like that because that's what the, that's the power of these discovered attacks. So I was just trying to figure out what move do I want to play. And bishop c1 did look pretty good because I'm, you know, I can follow it up with this and have a little fork there. But I also was thinking like his king's over here. Do I really want to go chasing down some pieces on the other side of the board? Uh, maybe not. And so then I was thinking bishop takes g5 to remove this pawn and then maybe I could take on h4 and now he has no pawns here and it keeps my bishop closer to his king to hopefully get checkmate or something like that, right? So that's what I ended up doing, capturing on g5, just to keep the pressure on the king. Now, the computer actually said that bishop c1 was the best move, uh, but I didn't obviously know that at the time, so I, I just went with bishop takes g5. All right, so my opponent has to deal with the attack on his queen. He played queen to g4, and now I saw another little trick that I could play. So he's attacking my bishop, but I didn't worry about it because if he moves the queen there, then his knight, which is currently being defended, is no longer defended and my rook can, can come down. And that's a really good trade because it puts a rook on the seventh rank or second rank in this case, attacks his king, very aggressive position for my rook to be in. I was happy with that. So because of that, I played knight f6 to bring another piece in and to attack his queen, right? So he can't just take my bishop with his pawn because I'm taking his queen. And again, if he takes there, like I said before, opens up that for my rook to go to e2. So it just seemed like a very strong move to bring another piece into the attack. And my opponent actually did blunder and, and take the bishop. I guess he was thinking that it, you know, it was just a trade. Um, and maybe he thought he could survive the attack after I, I took back. I'm not exactly sure why he took that, but he did take it. I captured it with my rook. And you can see his king is in all kinds of trouble. Um, we've got this rook here. We've got the queen ready to come in. We've also got this rook lined up with a discovered attack with the knight if he moves to like f3. I mean, very strong position for me. So my opponent played king f3. He's putting himself into this discovered attack with my knight. So if I wanted to, I could play a move like knight e4 check and then take his queen. The issue with that is after I go there, he does take my rook. And then after this, he can take my knight. So he's going to get a rook and a knight out of the deal, which is not terrible. So I felt like queen h2 was actually the stronger move because I just, I leave this discovered attack until later. I go ahead and defend my rook, bring my queen closer to his king. And if you check his king right now, he actually can't move anywhere. The rook covers these diagonals, the queen covers this, and the knight covers this square. So his king can't even move. So he can't escape this attack. I can do that next move. And so he really has no way out of this position. He played queen to g3, and then he actually resigned before I even played my move. I was going to do something like knight e4 check and win the queen. So at this point, it's, it's over. All right, guys, well, those are the two games. I hope you learned something from those. Thanks for watching this series. This is probably gonna be the last one since I'm rated right around 2200, a little bit higher on online like speed chests and stuff, but I figured this is a good place to probably stop the series. I have some other video ideas that I wanna get started on, so I'll be working on those. But as always, thanks for watching. Stay sharp, play smart, and take care.